On behalf of the Chairman, Geoffrey Smith, welcome to Sotheby's Australia's August sale of important Australian art. Once again, Sotheby's team of specialists has assembled a carefully curated selection of significant Australian paintings, drawings and sculpture, representing a variety of periods and styles, colonial, impressionist, modern and contemporary, drawn from notable collections in Australia and overseas. Although it is of modest dimensions, this painting is of immense historical significance. It is only the third painting in oil by a settler artist to show the Australian Aboriginal people, and the very first to depict the Palawa, the indigenous people of Tasmania. It was painted by Robert Neal, who was a commissariat officer serving in Van Diemen's Land and in the Swan River district. Neal was a keen amateur of natural history, and he sent specimens and drawings to correspondents in the UK. And his ethnographic interests were particularly marked. He illustrated Edward John Eyre's journals of exploration, for example. And there are three drawings in the Mitchell Library which show the Tasmanians. In this painting, you can see those ethnographic interests very much to the fore in the physiognomy, in the attitudes, in the toolkit and the foodstuffs of the indigenous Palawa. What is truly remarkable about this picture though is its date. It's from 1828 and shows peacefulness um, and relaxation right on the very edge of the Black War of 1828. A remarkable feature of the sale is that we have two works from Sidney Nolan's Annus Mirabilis of 1948, which reflect his recent explorations of outback Queensland. From June, we have Desert Bird. The bird of the title, like that in the Pretty Polly Mine or uh, the Dog and Duck Hotel, reflects something of the artist's amateur enthusiasm for ornithology. But it is essentially a natural landscape, with the essence of the picture being an exploration of that extraordinary, luminous, opalescent Queensland wetlands. Remarkably, this picture has been in the one collection since it was first purchased the year it was painted. Then, from several months later, in November, we have the Royal Hotel. This is essentially a cultural landscape. In it, Nolan begins to develop his imagery of iron-laced pubs and spade-bearded settlers humanising the landscape experience. But despite their differences, these works share a single quality. Nolan's extraordinary capacity to render what Cynthia Nolan once called a land as flat as a strap and flooded by the light of dreaming. Peter Booth is one of the great Australian painters of the late 20th century. Known for his sonorous black slab abstractions of the 1970s and especially for his fiery, apocalyptic, expressionist visions of mutants and monsters from the 1980s. But towards the end of that decade, the tone shifts somewhat and he produces a series of winter landscapes of rocks and trees. There is still a chill. The artist had been reading Macbeth and watching the Bosnian War on television. But this is altogether a quieter darkness, more akin to the 19th century romantic sublime, Caspar David Friedrich rather than John Martin. But what this picture shows above all is Booth's absolute virtuoso command of his medium. Here the luscious, thick paint doesn't so much describe the rocks and snow as construct them. It may be devoid of human presence, but there's plenty of life in the paint. This powerful Juno-esque flesh girl, Orange Nude, was a major work in Whiteley's 1981 studio exhibition, Recent Nudes. It epitomises that most important aspect of Whiteley's painting, its sensuality, or even its explicit sexuality. Here we see the artist rejoicing in the curve of breasts, of hips, of thighs, and the erotic flow and twist of the body is echoed in the shapes of the bentwood chair behind. Of course, that's not all. With Whiteley, more is always more. The painting contains subtle references to paintings by 
Pablo Picasso and Henri Matisse. On the wall behind the figure, you can see a beautiful White Lian landscape. And there is even an intimate autobiographical detail with White Lian's little Aussie terrier sitting beneath the chair, oblivious to the grand golden goddess above. John Olson spent some of his formative years in Spain and Spanish memories resonate throughout his oeuvre. This work originated in a visit of 1985. Olson saw Francisco Goya's black paintings in the Prado and became obsessed with the famous image of a dog, incorporating it in several paintings. Here, the dog is suspended above a pan of paella, another of the artist's Spanish obsessions. Its circular form, reminiscent of the great Five Bells or Sydney Sun from the 1960s. Around and between the two motifs is a typical Olsen-esque calligraphy of figures and symbols and architecture and landscape and rubbish and spots and squiggles and little figures. Out of the chaos of perception and experience, Olsen creates a vivid, joyous work of art, one described by the critic Gary Catalano as among the best paintings Olsen has produced. In 1907, following his return from a European tour, Frederick McCubbin moved with his family to a house in Kensington Road, South Yarra. There, from the extensive overgrown gardens, he had a beautiful picturesque view across the Yarra to the Burnley stone quarries, to Richmond Hill, and further afield to the city of Melbourne. And he painted this view on numerous occasions. This work, Golden Light, is typical of the artist's late paintings. McCubbin had all his life been an admirer of the great English painter J.M.W. Turner and the experience of seeing Turner in London in the flesh had a considerable impact. In this work's subtle, delicate, chromatic and tonal balances and in the liveliness of its surface with its touches of palette knife and brush, he conveys homage to the great master of golden light. I trust these works convey some impression of the richness of offerings in Sotheby's August sale. My colleagues and I look forward to welcoming you to previews in Melbourne and in Sydney.